My name is Esther Wojcicki. I live in the heart of Silicon Valley. I have been teaching at Palo Alto High School. I also teach at Stanford. I've had thousands of amazing students over the years, and I'm happy to say that I'm in touch with many of them. It's been a very rewarding experience for me. You're that teacher. Everyone has that teacher, I guess. Usually one teacher that made a difference. Yeah. I think the sad thing is there are a lot of people that can't even find one teacher. So that's why I'm trying to make it so that all teachers are memorable and all teachers have students that come back to see them. The teaching profession is a very blessed position because we need teachers in this world. Thanks to the pandemic that we're experiencing, I've seen parents and people that have posted messages and the essence of the message is, now I know the teacher is not the problem. So they begin to understand that the teacher is really their friend and a very powerful person to help them raise their child. This change in attitude. It's sad because the, the change in attitude is basically now people are going back to old school values. From my parents' era, we respected teachers, and teachers has a role to play, not just a nanny at school. That's right. You know, you're not just a caretaker. You are somebody that the student should want to have in their life, helping to coach them to be the best that they can be, and not a figure that is a fearful figure. And a lot of schools around the world People are afraid of teachers. Why are they afraid? Because they're afraid they'll make a mistake or they're afraid the teacher will make fun of them or they're afraid they'll get a bad grade. And so my goal is to explain that a teacher is most effective when they're seen as a coach, as somebody who can support their actions, whatever they are, and help them be the best they can be and not overly critical but whatever suggestions are made are seen as suggestions to help them be better, not criticism. That's a big difference. Yeah, with the modern world, everyone's just chasing accolades. The children are chess pawns. What's happened is they're not just chess pawns. Children are treated kind of like pets in a pet show. Oh, here's my daughter. And... Of course, everybody wants to like, oh, how cute she is, and she's dressed so well. And and then the next thing is like, can she perform? You know, this is not a pet. This is a child. <laughs> and you need to remember that. All the parents need to remember that all the children, they're like a gift from God. And your responsibility as the parent is to nurture them and not to make them in your image. It's whatever world set out to make them you know we need a lot of different types of people in the world if everyone's the same and we all have the same skills the world won't function so we have to have to respect this individuality and cherish who they are and respect yeah. who they are that's where the trust and respect and my acronym comes in. Researching you was most enjoyable and made me wish I was your student too. After stalking you online and binge watching many of your speeches, I've gotten used to the idea of addressing you like everyone else in Silicon Valley. Watch, that's what they call you. <laughs> that is absolutely true. Even all the parents are like, I walk down the street and they're like, hey, Wodge, there you are. I, I respond to Wodge very easily. Uh, your three daughters are also Wodge. Well, they call themselves Little Wodge. And I'm like okay. Little Wodge 1 and Little Wodge 2 and Little Wodge 3. <laughs> so funny. What yeah. about the husband? He's a Wodge too, right? Yeah, my husband, of course, is responsible for the name. <sighs> you know, it's like Mr. Wodge. He's like, what? What are your students calling me? <laughs> okay. And they're always asking, like, where is Mr. Wodge? I said, well, you know, he works. He doesn't necessarily come to school. And they seem to think he's supposed to be there with me. I was like, no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Dads go to work and moms go to work. <laughs>
<laughs> but I guess to them, you're like a mascot of sorts. I am sort of a mascot of sorts. Yeah. They have one sweatshirt they made a few years ago. It was Wodge Yourself. That was maybe <laughs> <laughs> well, like sort of a play on Watch Yourself, but it's Wodge Yourself. You're supposed to make yourself into a Wodge. It's basically to practice my trick. That's exactly right. You have groupies. I have groupies. Why? <laughs> And a lot of your groupies are very special people. They're not ordinary at all. They're all doing something interesting and special. The groupies are everywhere. Boy. And they are also your students, am I right? A lot of them are former students. There's thousands of those. A lot of them will grow up to be parents as well. Most of them. That's why your book was written for them. I wrote the first book, Moonshots in Education. And my target audience was teachers. I was trying to help teachers be more effective in the classroom. And a lot of the same ideas that I wrote in the first book, which came out in 2015, are incorporated in the second book. But the target audience for the second book was parents and teachers. So first it's parents, then it's teachers, then it's corporate world, all three, because the principles in the book apply to all three groups. And yes. the reason that I wrote was because I had so many questions from teachers all the time, like, what was I doing in my class? And I thought, well, I'll write a book and then they'll know. For the second book, the questions continued, but then a lot of the questions were coming from parents. The question was, what did you do with your daughters? What did you feed them? And I like, I wanted to make it clear that it wasn't what I fed them. It was how I fed them. And so I gave them an opportunity to be independent. And so I wanted to make that really clear. And I also wanted to tie it to the corporate world and to actually the world at large. So that's why I wrote the second book. And do I have a third book in me? It looks like I may have a third book. I think the third book is going to be somewhat of a playbook of exactly how to implement TRIC, which is the acronym for the book, Trust, Respect, Independence, Collaboration, Kindness, how to implement that for parents and for corporate leaders. I already did one for teachers, so I'm not leaving them out. I want to target parents. Like, what does it look like exactly? I thought I gave enough examples and how to raise successful people. But I think people want more examples. And I said, okay, no problem. I'll write another book next year, not this year. I'm still dealing with the publication of how to raise successful people. It's coming out this summer in China. Wow. And later on, it will be in Japan wow. and Korea and Hong Kong and... Um, and Cambodia. It's pretty exciting. It's coming out in 21 languages. <gasps> the That's first cool. English version was launched May 5th. That's right. Uh, and the paperback English version is coming out in August. And mm -hmm. it will come out in New York and in London at the same time. So I will do another big push on that book uh, mm -hmm. when it comes out. So I have to see... I have to try to figure out a good strategy. No one's going to conferences right now. And so maybe I can do something on a webinar like this, like with you. Do you have any plans to make a picture book for kids, perhaps? That's a great idea. You could do the illustration. Okay, perfect. That's a deal. <laughs> this is just going to be like a picture book, right? Easy one. I'm sure it's going to have something to do with kitty cats, right? Uh, I can just watch you, right? <laughs> you to watch, just watch me. <laughs> I can give you some suggestions, but I do like your kitty cats, by the way. Visualize how your picture book's going to be and uh -huh. write the copy. And then I look at it and inspiration will come and I'll sketch something. Okay, sounds perfect. That's a great idea, honestly. Or you can call it watch yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> I know. I still can't believe it. I wear that sweatshirt and it's like I still can't believe it's 
there, but it is. I'm very, I'm very happy about it. You've been a teacher for nearly 40 years. My husband would go out to a dinner, fancy people. He's like, hey, don't correct anyone tonight. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll remember. I'll remind myself not to say anything. <laughs> Is that difficult? <laughs> no, it's just kind of built in. You were talking about leaving the school system. The big news is that I decided I'm retiring from the school district to concentrate on teaching teachers. When are you going to do that? In June. It's the end of the school year. So whoever who's in your class right now, this is it, last batch. Last batch. But you have teachers. For them. My goal is to help them be more effective. So okay. I can have a bigger impact working with the teachers than I can working with the students because otherwise I'm just working with, I don't know, 50 or 100 kids. Every time I work with 50 or 100 teachers, each one of those teachers has 100 kids. So it's a much more effective way to implement the system. Higher impact. My goal is impact. It seems to be working. I wrote the book. It's really popular. I've given lots of talks all over the place. And I'm just waiting to see when this is ever going to open up. Maybe I can travel at some point again. But I don't see it happening before Christmas. My prediction is that a lot of impatient people will open up the schools and everything's too soon. And then they're going to have a bigger attack of the virus than we already had. Yep. Um, and so then we can't go anywhere again. So that's another reason that I decided to retire because the school system is very unstable right now. I can be more effective helping teachers deal with the school system than I can be just working with 60 to 100 students. Your messages have been made simple. I guess that's where the impact is going to travel far. Well, that's always been my goal. Ever hear of the KISS principle? I mean, the acronym is kind of humorous. It's K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, stupid. If you keep it simple, I swear everybody gets it. Why do we make it complicated? It's just so crazy. No, simple is what works. To break it down, to make it so that it's easy for people to understand. You know, you need to break it down. Make it simple. I'm doing <laughs> corporate seminars now. I'm Because it changes the culture of the corporation and people love working there and that is what all companies need to have whether they're small medium-sized or large and if you treat your employees with trust and respect they will do anything for you most of the people leave their job because they don't feel respected or appreciated that's the number one reason for leaving and sometimes people will even stay at a company where they have a lower salary just because the people at that company care about them. It's more powerful than people realize. I do have a team. It's right now in the coronavirus pandemic. They're not together. Everybody's working from home. Four people that are working the corporate trick philosophy. I have another team of people that are working on the trick philosophy for parents. And then another team that is working on trick philosophy in the schools. So one of the things that I'm writing about these days is how to deal with the coronavirus when your kids are at home all the time. And what should parents be doing? And I think it's not been very successful here in the U.S. About 50% of kids don't go to school. They don't go online. They just don't. Or if they do, they mute themselves or they do crazy things. And one of the problems is that teachers in many cases try to recreate the classroom on a Zoom call, and that just doesn't work. So there are groups out there that are trying to help teachers be more effective, and maybe, I think, and I'm pretty sure within the next month or two, it will be better, because I don't think, this is my prediction, that was just mine, that school will start as normal at the mm -hmm. beginning of September. I think if it starts, it will be maybe Half the students will go one day and the other half the next day, they'll cut down the number of students in the school. There's a lot of different ways that they might be doing it. Whenever you make big changes like that, it's really hard for people to be effective. One thing I can say, though, is I have been really impressed with how the countries in Asia have dealt with this. 
China was very smart. All right, it was some kind of a mistake in the first place. But aside from that one mistake, it could have happened anywhere in the world because a lot of places are investigating infectious diseases. They don't have any cases now. Yeah. Singapore was very smart. Korea, also very smart. The reaction in Asia has been logical. Everybody comes together. There's no fighting about how to go forward. Whereas in the U.S., if you're watching what's going on in the U.S., yeah. it's political. Vice President Pence, he went into a hospital no. without a mask. He just walked in like it was a spring day. It's really a, a crazy situation. This is something that we should be working on together as a team. And I think that Asian countries have shown how effective it can be. And us also in Germany is very effective. And in many of the European countries, the way that this is handled. This is um, an individual case with the USA with a few people in power behaving without wisdom. It's just that. It is just that. But who would ever think of defunding the World Health Organization in the midst of a pandemic? I can't even believe this happened. It's astounding that, you know, the president of our country recommended that we should use Lysol. You saw that. I saw that, yeah. You know, inject it. And then the company had to put out all these advertisements everywhere. Don't do it. No, this is not a good idea. And it costs them a lot of money to advertise that. When you're looking at facts, where you're doing critical thinking, it should not be governed by political stance. Critical thinking is critical thinking, whether you're right, left, center, whatever. And that needs to get across. There are groups here that are just very poorly educated and can't think intelligently. The main thing I'm hoping for is a medication that works then getting the disease would not be so frightening. It would be great to also have a vaccination. But having lived through the polio epidemic, I realized that to get everybody vaccinated against polio took years. So even if we discovered a vaccine tomorrow, it would take a long time to manufacture it and then to implement it, to give it to all these people would be a very laborious thing to do. I tuned into Bill Gates a few weeks ago and he talked about the vaccine. According to that session, I learned that they've been expecting a pandemic for years and preparing to counter a pandemic like this. It typically takes a year to a year and a half to find it. A lot of people are working on it. There's a race. Great to have a lot of people working on it. Bill Gates has been very smart with all of this. It's been very impressive to see. First of all, he predicted this. And now he has a philosophy that makes a lot of sense. Find a medication or find a vaccination. And he doesn't just talk about it. He's actually putting his resources behind it. And I really admire him. I would like to say that I don't really admire Jeff Bezos in the same way. Okay, I'm happy to have Amazon deliver my things quickly. But I haven't noticed him doing anything to help out in this pandemic. And he's the richest man in the world by far. His wealth exceeds the budget of many countries and he could easily do more to help out and um, i know he i've met him i admire him i think he's a smart nice guy and i hope that he's going to concentrate on helping the world a little bit more so this is your call to action to him right what can you do to help in the medical arena or helping with people whose lives have been interrupted completely disrupted by this virus right now we have 25 million people in the united states without a job and I hope that he can, I don't want to suggest them, but I hope he takes some action. Jeff Bezos. Bill Gates has been active for more than 20 years. Bill Gates is doing a lot. Yeah. I admire him and his wife. I started my journey in impact also reading about Bill Gates and Melinda Gates and the things that they do, how they use their resources was really inspiring for people with and without money. So at that point I was in my 20s and I'm not going to be a billionaire in my own rights, but what can I do to be part of this kind of practice? So I started to design my my life to have resources and share it with the world in the most impactful way possible. Also influence people with the money to to spend impactfully, inspired by Bill and Melinda Gates. They have really done a good job of yeah. being inspirational and they've done a they try really hard and humble at the same time, I must say. I saw in the back of one of these magazines, there was a list of all the billionaires in the world. And there's a lot of them, four or five pages, single space to list them all. And the question is, what are these people doing to help? And I don't know. We only hear about a few people, but it would be nice if we could hear about more. What are you going to do with a billion dollars? Even if you spend a lot of money every day, 
by the time you die, you still would have a lot left over. And yeah. you know, who wants to be the richest guy in the cemetery? Yeah. What are you going to do then? The, the new generations will find creative ways to impact the world. We don't want them to create situations to destroy the world. We want them to make the world a better place in some way. It would be huge. I think one positive outcome of the pandemic is that the pollution seems to have dropped dramatically. In India, cities that you couldn't even see from one side of the street to the other are now clear. <laughs> there are some benefits, but this is not the way to get to our goal. Well, this is one very powerful way to stop everything. We, we never could have achieved this in any, it's just amazing what, what's happened. And people have to get real with themselves now. They have a lot of time to stare at themselves in the mirror and have that conversation. Instead of just being critical and lamenting this terrible situation we have, you have to use it as an opportunity to yeah. spend more time with your family. And yeah. um, because a lot of people, you know, you're stuck at home with all these people that you live with, but you normally don't have very much time for. And then even if you're not stuck at home with them, you can do a Zoom call with your relatives. Everybody's got a lot of time now. We won't be talking if it wasn't for the pandemic. That's right, because I probably would be flying somewhere. I'd be on a plane going someplace and giving another talk. And that is pretty much all I did. Just think about my last fall, October, November, December. So I flew from Beijing. I was in New You're York. In Singapore too, right? I was in Singapore, Mexico City. Now I can fly over the world with Zoom. <laughs> no jet lag. <laughs> so I did a talk about two weeks ago that was for a group in the Ukraine. Oh, and wow. as you can imagine, I didn't have to fly to the Ukraine. And the talk was also broadcast in Belarus and Georgia and wow. Moldova. Uh, it was really kind of amazing. And I was here at my house. I had a translator and it was translated into five different languages simultaneously. It was a very unusual experience for me. For me, it works better to get my message out more easily without a lot of effort. I appreciate that. I do miss seeing people. But honestly, I think I would trade this online version in any case, because it's so stressful on your body. Fly to New York, it took five hours each way. Yes. And then I'd give a talk in New York for maybe an hour and a half or two hours. Spend the night there. There's all kinds of other things. Suitcases and they lose things. And oh my God. So it's just so much easier this way on a webinar or on a podcast. Why not do it that way? My goal is the message. So you can watch it live or you can watch it asynchronously. And asynchronously, I think, is the best. When it's live, it doesn't work out so well. So people will be able to watch it whenever it's convenient for them. That's just great. If I could spend a year somewhere, I would pick Singapore. It's beautiful. The people yeah. are friendly and sensible. And then I can travel all over Asia. It's a central location. It's just a beautiful city. The food was incredible. The people were friendly. It was great. How do you get there? Flying's just 45 minutes. I don't like flying because door to door, it ends up becoming about four hours. Sometimes I will drive down with people, hitch a ride because I've got so many friends who are dual existence, Singapore, KL. You're multinational. Overseas Chinese, you know, they call us. My mother was originally from Taiwan. That's one place I have to go, Taiwan and Taipei. My daughter went and she said it was great. My mom is Taiwanese and my father is Malaysian. Well, I want you to know I was in Kuala Lumpur. Well, when? A long time ago. You were a little kid. Okay. And I drove with my husband. We drove all over Malaysia. What? Yes. Our hobby was travel. We love to travel. Every summer, and most people, you know, if you spend your money on decorating your house or fancy clothes. We spent our money on travel. So that's how we ended up in Kuala Lumpur. What did you do in Kuala Lumpur? Which year was this? I'm trying to think. It was in the 1980s. Um, but we were also in Singapore. If I could remember all the cities, we drove it was a loop all the way around. One coast, and then we drove to another coast. You would have been to Penang. Yes. You would have been to Malacca. Yes, that's right. You probably would have been to Kuantan. Yes. We were there for two weeks. Wow. Did you go to any islands? No, we didn't go to any islands. So did you drive down to Singapore? Yes, and we drove from Singapore into Malaysia. We crossed this bridge. The Johor? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the contrast between the two countries was dramatic. Literally within 50 feet of each other, it was like another world. I couldn't believe it, but I enjoyed it anyway. You know, I thought it was very interesting. I liked meeting everybody and we literally just picked hotels as we drove by. It's like, oh, that one looks good. Let's stay there. And of course, we had just a map. 
We didn't have the internet. It was not as easy. We were prepared to sleep in a tent if need be. We brought a tent. So we managed to find hotels everywhere. So this was after you had kids. Yeah, that was after we had kids. They were not with us during that trip. We just did it ourselves. I know my daughter Susan really likes Singapore, so she might want to come. One of my grandchildren would like to go to Singapore. I think it's a good place for them to go. So you have eleven grandchildren. Ten. The youngest one is ten months old. I'm the grandmother. Matter of fact, I'm called in to do all kinds of crazy things. I need. I have to go over to visit one of them today. They all have special requests, constantly. Special requests. How old is the eldest grandkid? Twenty. My one of my children had children early. I had kids early. She had kids early. You do have a multi generational thing going on there.、Uh, all these kids, all the grandkids. It's multi generational. So you probably need to produce a book for grandparents. I was actually thinking of doing that, how to grandparent in the 21st century, but in general, harder to change habits when you're used to doing them for a long time. Maybe that's not the best use of my time and energy. A book for toddlers should also be for grandparents. They will like the book and they will love to read it to their grandchildren. That's a great idea. We could designate the book for the grandchildren and the grandparents. So it's a message for the kid, but then the grandparents are going to be reading it. That's right. So the message could actually have a hidden agenda. <laughs> Grandparent, let me tell you what you have to tell your grandchildren. Hint, hint. Maybe you should do that too. <laughs> your father was an artist. My father was an artist. He he did good work. He was very artistic. It was great. The artist's life isn't exactly bed of roses. I started in in media when I was fourteen years old. That's my early life. Throughout high school, I wasn't a very good student because I was hardly there. I probably only attend three days out of five days of school. I was on the film set most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I was also very active in my extracurriculum. And ever since I was a child, my parents put me through art classes. I had three art teachers: piano, ballet, and swimming. So I was really busy every day after school. And school was very easy for me in that sense because since I was a kid, I had a schedule like a politician. <laughs> I didn't actually enjoy school very much because I was a very timid and quiet child. Anne is about the same age as you, exactly. I'm July. What day in July? Because my daughter Anne is born on the twenty eighth of July. I'm thirty first. <laughs> We're Leos. Yes, I studied the Leo characters, so I know it's good. My daughter Anne is Leo, right? So I'm like, oh, what is she going to be like? What about you, Gemini? Yes, Gemini. The 26th of May. Well, actually, I was on my way to move myself to LA, and I didn't raise enough money. Last year, when I met you, I decided to do a 10-week trip. East Coast and West Coast to make sure I'm not going to move after all. So when I was there, I got to meet you. That's interesting. That was a good lucky break. Yeah. I had no idea what I was attending that evening at DVF. It's fancy, and so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to get on my little scooter. I remember your scooter. Yeah. I scoot a couple of miles and go to DVF. I arrived pretty late. The panel was already going on. I hung around and I learned quickly what the event was about. I didn't even expect to meet you. Oh well, it worked out. It was funny because I was standing on the toilet line and Johnny was standing right before me, and we were just talking about how long that line was. And then later on, <laughs> he came up and chatted with me, and his other friends came, and we started to talk about compassion. I have a movement of random kindness. Have a movement for empathy, and all these movements are part of my art. I don't only do visual work. My art is for creating impact, so it could be really abstract as well. So I kind of talked about that, and they were like, "Have you met Esther yet?" No, I haven't. Esther, meet Poisy, and that was it. And you said, 
actually, I live in Palo Alto. Palo Alto is a place that's very dear to my heart because I did my surgery in Stanford. I remember you told me that your doctor, he lives on my street, five houses away. I felt an immediate connection to you. And then you said, in fact, I'll be back in New York. Before I learned that you were the godmother of Silicon Valley, you were neighbors to Dr. John Adler, my doctor in Stanford. <laughs> This is a coincidence, but at the same time, for me, it's like a divine delivery. The first Google office was in your daughter, Susan's garage. That's right. And, and she went on to become CEO of YouTube. Besides all the family connections, you were also involved in the early days of Google. I was involved in the education component of Google, Google EDU. I guess that's not so surprising considering my background. And I helped start the Google Teacher Academy and the Google EDU. And I worked on all these products, Google Docs and Google Spreadsheet and Google presentations and, and it was exciting. I had a great time doing it. I was very happy to help start the Google Teacher Academy because then we could impact teachers worldwide. And today, for example, thanks to Google Teacher Academy, there's also resources the like Google Education. All these resources online for teachers teaching in this COVID virus epidemic situation. It's called Learn at Home. That is the YouTube portion. And then Teach at Home is the Google education portion. So it was very exciting for me to be there at the beginning and help conceptualize the way it should go. And it's going great. Very helpful for teachers. It was exciting for me to be able to be part of that. How long were you in those projects? About two years. And then I left primarily because I was doing other things at school, teaching. Your school also went from a couple of trailers to one huge wing right now. Well, my program went from about 20 kids to over 700 students today, six other teachers. So it took a lot of my time, and I was really interested in focusing on my education. I had already done a lot of stuff at Google, so I wasn't sure that the impact was as great at Google as it would have been in the school. So your media art school, how old are the students? 15 to 18, usually grades 10, 11, and 12. Um, for the 700 students, there's about 10 publications, one newspaper, multiple magazines, a radio program, television program every day, and movies. They may have their own movie film festival. And so the idea is to give students as much opportunity as possible in the 21st century. This is a century of media. Why not let kids enjoy it? So you actually Rupert Murdoch of the school media. <laughs> yes, you could call me the Rupert Murdoch of the <laughs> media program in the world for students. What analogy. Yes, it's true. Oh, that's a really powerful platform. It's powerful because it's real world. It teaches students really important skills for the 21st century. The number one thing it teaches them is to be self-learners, which is the number one goal for most educational institutions. It also teaches collaboration and communication and critical thinking and creativity. Those are the main goals of for the 21st century. Everyone wants to hire people with media skills and thinking skills. Be an independent worker. I think that's really important. Can you tell me if there's any profession that will not benefit from having media skills? Well, maybe even fishermen need to have media skills to understand, you know, the weather and the currents and the fish and, and even gardeners, I was going to say farmers, but they profit a lot from having media skills as well. I would say somebody that's a worker, hard labor, maybe you don't need media skills for that. But everything else in the world, you need media skills. It benefits everybody. It's universal. How do you think media can reform itself? I guess you could agree that the content is regenerative. One of the reasons that there's so much sensationalism in media today is because newspapers get paid by the click. What it does is encourages newspapers to put sensational headlines on stories because then they get more clicks. So if they could decouple 
the clicks from the money they make, then there wouldn't be as much sensationalism. All the publications are doing that. The only ones that don't do that are the nonprofits. Rupert Murdoch's publications are the largest in the world, and they are the most sensational in the world. They write about unbelievable things. Maybe you should leave him a message. Well, the message would be, could you please stop sensationalizing your stories? That would be a good message for him. And can you make sure that your stories don't have a political message at the same time? It's too much politics connected with Rupert Murdoch's publications. Fox News is the largest news publication in the world. He has a lot of power. Can he use that power for good? That would be the best. That would be the call to action from Mr. Murdoch. What about a call to action for everyone who's listening in? Well, the call to action would be to implement the trick philosophy in their lives. It will make their life better and make the life of their partner better and the life of their co-workers better. I mean, when you treat people with trust and respect and you collaborate, you don't dictate. And of course, you treat them with kindness. It works better for everyone. I'm just going to do a rundown of trick. is trust, is respect, independence, collaboration, kindness. Yes, that's it. Our listeners, friends can go check out your books. The book is called How to Raise Successful People, Simple Lessons for Radical Results. And it will be out pretty much many of the Asian languages, so you can look. In your own words, how would you describe your legacy? My legacy, I'd like them to think of me as changing the way education is conceptualized. So the learner, the student, is in the driver's seat for the most part. So people have more control, more power, and they have more productive school experience. When you learn like that as a child, you grow up to be a happier adult, more productive adult. And so the goal is to make the world a better place because we all need to work together. As we can see, the planet is suffering, and we need to make sure that this is a place where human beings can live for many, many centuries more happily. I know you're pretty funny. I'm funny because I find the humor in life. Uh oh, that's my daughter. Do you uh, need to pick her up? Yeah, wait a minute. I have to go answer. <laughs> So that was my daughter, Anne. I do have to go over to her house now. She can be very directive, let's put it that way. She's a Leo. Yes, I think she might have learned a thing or two from her mother. <laughs> <laughs> very quickly, will there be a master class and what would it be called? There sh I should do a master class. I have thought about it, but I'm doing so many things at the moment until maybe later this summer. I think it would be on basically how to use trick to lead a better life. I think if people could understand it more effectively, they would feel better about themselves and feel better about the things that are going on in their life. My philosophy is that you can't really control life. Nobody can control the fact that we have this horrible virus, but you can control your reaction to life. Your reaction to life determines how you live your life. And so it'd be great to have a masterclass helping people live more satisfactory lives. I look forward to that. Thanks for the suggestion. You're full of good <laughs> questions. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you so much for making time to be the first guest on Power Beauty Conversations. I'm very excited to share your episode with the world and look out for the children's book that's going to be coming up. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. See you. See you. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.